I'm going to go ahead and start our session and we'll allow other attendees to join us along the way if they choose. So good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Florida Department of Health in Volusia County, welcome to the 2021 Path for Hope Virtual Summit. This session is the Pearl Project. Make sure you're in the right place. My name is Lynn Kennedy and I'll be the facilitator for this session. Um, you will be muted during the session, but please feel free to enter questions into the chat box or raise your hand to be recognized to ask a question verbally. And we will also allow some time at the end of the session for question and answer. If you have requested CEUs for this session, please indicate your presence about halfway through. There will be a little pop-up and you can click on that pop-up to let us know you're still here. And also please take the survey at the end of the session to know for sure that um, you have completed your CEUs. We want to thank the Path for Hope Summit Planning Committee partners, Advent Health, Community Coalition Alliance, One Voice for Volusia, SMA Healthcare, and Volusia Recovery Alliance. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today, Beth Willis. And Beth and her family moved to the Central Florida area in the summer of 2013. She's the mom of two sons, ages 26 and 17. Beth and her family have experience with the dependency court system through the emergency placement of her cousins. Since that time, Beth has become a trust-based relational intervention practitioner and a circle of security parent trainer. She has earned a professional certification in trauma and resilience. Beth enjoys working with both kinship and biological families. She dreams of the day when all individuals know their value. Beth, Thank I will you. welcome you to this session. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I'm glad to be here. Um, I, I'm always um, just honored and excited to be able to share about the Pearl Project and about what we do and what it is that brought me to um, this work. So I'm going to, let me see. on just a second. All right, the Pearl Project is a small nonprofit organization. We're located here in Central Florida. Um, we got our start in Ocala. Um, friends of mine, Joy and Steven Zedler became foster parents and when their first placement um, came to their home, they found out that they didn't really know that much about what the challenges were going to be um, with those kiddos. So um, Joy's parents had become guardian ad litems in Oklahoma just as a way to support other foster and adoptive families um, and show their own support for Joy and Steven since they couldn't be here to, to help them in other ways. As they were learning things there in Oklahoma, they found out about something called trust-based relational intervention. And they actually encouraged Joy to go to a um, weekend uh, session. It was, I believe it was in Alabama, that first one. Um, and they attended that and they got to hear several different people speak and they learned a way of parenting that was not just natural to them. And that is um, when Joy came back to Ocala and she kind of said, we've got to keep this in front of us. We have to share this with other people like us. And we have to just, you know, present this and support each other in community as we learn this and as we continue to transition to this type of parenting. Um, I've heard TBRI described as a a type of parenting or a parenting course, but I think it's a lot more than that. It has to do with ourselves first and foremost and how we react and what triggers we have. And as we learn about ourselves, we then learn about the kiddos that we're trying to parent. So some of the things um, since the inception of the Pearl Project as a nonprofit, some of the things that we have continued to do are trauma-informed trainings and workshops. Just this week, we had a TBRI for teens, and we have multiple uh, families represented in that to learn alternative ways to, to really um, interact with our teens so that we, have, we can form a relationship. 
Um, we also offer support groups for foster, adoptive, and kinship families. We offer one-on-one -on -one TBRI practitioner support, um, you know, where we can schedule a, a meeting, a Zoom meeting, or an in-person meeting with a family who's struggling and really, you know, help them through and kind of advise them. Um, we also, um, we have a kid-to-kid -kid foster closet here in Ocala. Um, Another organization was sponsoring that. And when we came along, they said, you know, you can have at it. So um, we have a great, it's three rooms of clothing, baby gear, diapers, um, any families that need items from that, you know, we, we try to help them. Um, but it's primarily focused for foster adoptive kinship families. Um, and then one of the other things that was very important and close to Joy's heart as she began this work was a NICU cuddle care program. She knew that um, both of the children that she adopted had been born after being um, exposed through several studies, one of which is a, a great Harvard study. We know that touch and um, holding these babies that are in the NICU helps them to recover up to twice as fast as just lying in, in the NICU in the isolate by themselves. So um, Joy and with Advent Healthcare here, here in Ocala began a program where kind of as a reward for the volunteers who have been with the hospital the longest, they can then apply and move to the NICU cuddle care. She has 13 cuddlers. And as I said, those are people who have been um, volunteering with the hospital for the longest amount of time. And then they move on and, and are trained by Joy herself so that she can teach them and share with them some of the things that I'm gonna share with you today. Um, okay, and this is Dr. Karen Purvis is the founder, um, the co-founder of TBRI. Uh, she was an undergraduate student at Texas Christian University as a 40, mid 40 year old woman, much, you know, like Joy and myself are. Um, and her professor, Dr. David Cross, was just enthralled by the way that Dr. Purvis would interact with children. Um, they went on and she stayed there for her for her master's. And Dr. Cross would follow her around and basically take um ornithographies um, of, of her, where he went around, you know, wrote down exactly what she did and how she interacted with the children. And from that became The Connected Child, which is the book that explains TBRI. We love, um, Dr. Purvis has so many just really wise quotes, and this is one, children who are harmed in relationship will only find healing through relationship. And I, I want to be clear about something. I say kiddos or kids or children, but you know what? Our children, they're the babies, the little arm babies, and they're the babies that are bigger than us. They're still babies and they're still somebody's babies. And we've got to continue to work with them and help them heal from the relational suffering that they experienced as a child, as a newborn, as a, as a young adult. Um, if we don't help, the, help them to heal from that, then, you know, they will continue to self-sabotage. They will continue to um, participate. Love them. We have to help heal them. We have to um, heal them through relationships that we have with them. So uh, one of the questions I'm sure that everyone came here with today is what exactly is TBRI? Um, it, so TBRI, like I told you, it was created at Texas Christian University by Dr. Karen Purvis and Dr. David Cross. Um, it is a holistic intervention. It's uh, been developed. I want to say that that initial work that they did was in uh, the late 90s, 97, 98. So it's been over the last 20 years now. Um, it's an evidence-based practice that meets the needs of the whole child. It's not just about their brain or their, their heart or their mind, but it's their sensory needs. It's 
every need that they have combined together. And we look at them as the whole and complete child and all these systems working interdependently with each other to give us the child that we're, we're interacting with. Um, is also an approach to caregiving that can be developmentally respectful and it's responsive to trauma and attachment base. And we're gonna learn a lot about attachment today as we continue. Um, today. Okay, this is a video. And this is they have these great little um, animates about TBRI and different principles of TBRI. So this is the first one. And it is a wonderful overview of what TBRI is. Uh oh, let me see if I can go back. Is there sound with this, Beth? There is, are you not hearing it? No, we're not. Okay, hold on. We okay. can, I can fix that. They have a voice. Thank you. TBRI, trust based relationship. It has three sets of principles, and they look at the child as a whole. When you think about development, the baby cries, and I say, Yes, I will comfort you. And so this child learns that they have a voice. They learn trust, which is the lesson of the first year of life. I can trust. There are so many children from hard places. And for those children, their capacity to trust has been fiercely damaged. The brain chemistry of a child who cries and no one comes is dramatically altered. The child with a history of trauma or loss or abuse has no hope of healing without a nurturing relationship. In every way that I make time and space, that I give touch, eye contact, and I give words. I am gonna empower this child to go back to the beginning of what he or she should have experienced in the arms of a loving parent that said, when you cry, I will come. The phenomenal thing about a trust-based intervention is, as we connect to this child, as we build safety, we actually change the brain chemistry. We change the wiring of the brain. This is really the heart and soul of all that we are and all that we do. Do I look into the child's eyes? Do I touch their arm when I talk to them? When they talk to me, do I stop what I'm doing and talk to them? This is the essence of mindfulness. The excitatory chemicals about, I'm afraid, I'm hungry, I'm cold, but those are balanced when the caregiver comes and gives warmth. All regulation occurs first with an external regulator. So in the beginning, I regulate all. They're cold, I bring warmth. They're crying, I bring myself. And out of my regulation, their brain develops capacity for self-regulation. If this child didn't have this experience, that child doesn't feel safe. This chemistry can be altered, first by knowing they're safe, second by nutrient-rich foods, Third, by my environmental regulation of that child's emotion. And fourth, by appropriate exercise. So we can balance brain chemistry by creating a holistic environment. We clearly have to deal with behavior. Correcting means showing a child the right behavior, praising him when he gets it, and showing it to him until he can get it right, and showing him with no fear and no shame so that he builds success, not a greater sense of failure. So the message of hope for our families is that we can help our children to dramatic levels of healing. We simply have to be devoted to it and be willing to invest what it's going to take. Okay. 
So that's a, I love that little um, animate. It gives us a great overview of what TBRI is. But then we, we jump right into it. And it talked about, you know, understanding risks and what risk, what the risk factors are um, for trauma in children. Um, we know that, of course, we talk about abuse, neglect, and trauma day in and day out. But our little, our little babies, their bodies do not know the difference in um, stress from a mom who is stressed in a good way or stressed in a bad way. So the mom who doesn't know where her next hit, her next amount to use, the next amount of drugs that she's going to take, they don't know where that is. They don't know where they're going to sleep tonight. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. That kind of stress through a mom's body into the baby um, is the same type of stress that a mom who's building her dream house experiences. So we have a lot of people that come to our trainings and they say, you know, I came to this and I was trying to learn about, you know, this child that was placed with me or, you know, X, Y, Z, but I learned about my own biological child. We know that also, as well as that stressful pregnancy and those stress hormones, the cortisol um, and such that, that just flood the baby when mom is experiencing stress, we know that if there's a difficult birth, if there's a traumatic birth, if in any way the baby needs assistance from the doctor or medical staff during or you know, immediately after birth, that that can also cause some, some issues with the baby. We see a lot of sensory type issues with babies who are born via C-section. Um, we see things that, you know, they, they may just seem a little bit off to mom and dad. And then they, they say, well, baby was born, you know, with a cord wrapped around their neck, or, you know, we had, baby had to be resuscitated or needed oxygen after birth. And most of those things, you know, that then lead into early hospitalization. Well, I'm going to share part of Joy's story. Her, her son came to them at six weeks old. He had been born six weeks prematurely, and he was placed in his first foster placement, but he came to them at six weeks from the hospital because he had broken ribs and a skull fracture, and being treated at the hospital, the nurse who went to put a warming blanket on him actually um, used it incorrectly, and he received a third degree burn on his little foot. So by the time that it was his due date, he had already experienced all of this trauma. And to this day, he's about eight now. And when the air conditioner cuts on, he still reaches out and grabs that burnt, that same burnt foot um, that was burned at six weeks old. So you know and you see these things that, that really impact how the body responds to these early, early harms. Um, we also know abuse, neglect, and trauma, and those are the things that most people recognize. So we, we will be talking about that as well, but we just want you to think about those first three things um, and how those contribute to the, to the baby's um, body and how it's set on high when it starts off. Okay, the TBRI principles, the, this is what TBRI is made up of. You've got um, the connecting principles, which are mindfulness and engagement. And really to connect with a child or to connect with a person, you're going to be mindful of what you're bringing to the relationship. And you're going to look at yourself. And then we're going to talk about engagement strategies with how to interact with with the people or with the children. Um, then we're gonna talk about empowering principles, the physiological strategies and the ecological strategies. How can we empower our kids? You know, we all joke about when we get hangry where we're hung so hungry that we get angry on a short, quick fuse, our kiddos get that too. And so we, we know that if they were experienced in, ex exposed in your utero, I'm sorry, um, to alcohol or any type of substances, that their, their bodies are more likely to experience, you know, drops in glucose levels or um, 
I have a child that has seizures. And so we know that she has to stay hydrated to help prevent those seizures. So these things become more important um, for, for these guys that have something else going on in their past. And again, think about the adults, think about the relationships that you have with the people that you're serving, um, whether they're 15 or 55, you know, they're the same people. And where did they start? What happened to them? early on and how could how can we think about this as we're treating them and serving them okay then we have the tbri correcting principles we're not going to um, focus a lot on that it would be proactive strategies and that is mostly what tbri focuses on is what can we do ahead of the fact what i tell people when i'm describing tbri I say, you know, a lot of times we see um, kids that, that act up, they misbehave, they act out, and we think, oh, those are some really bad kids. But what it is, is that they don't have the language available to them to express to us what they're feeling, how they're feeling, how they're handling the stress or the, the um, heartbreak that's going on in their lives today. So how can we be proactive? How can we provide them with the resources that they need to learn to be connected with their feelings and then give them voice by listening to them and by helping them learn the new words to express these feelings to us in a healthy way? The responsive strategies would be what you would use with a child um, as far as correction goes. And you know, if we were doing the full a TBRI full caregiver class, it's 24 hours and we spend um, six hours, you know, on, on each principle, okay? So I, I believe that you are gonna see these principles again on a question. You may wanna pay attention to that. Okay. These are the, we call these the triangles when we talk about it. This is the upside down triangle. And this is how most people parent. Definitely this is how I parented before I came and found, you know, found out about TBRI. This triangle is not safe. We know that. We know that it's standing on its, on its tip and where the base of the triangle is, where it should be sitting, that is what we spend the biggest portion of our time doing and the most of our energy we spend correcting and you know if you think about um you know our government our our social justice system where where is the time and the money invested in that it's in correcting so what are we how are we empowering and connecting and developing relationships with these people who desperately need it like I said whether they're little arm babies or big babies. Um, so are we developing the relationships? Are we giving them the tools that they need to empower themselves to even learn about themselves as, as people and to connect and move forward with their lives? Now, when we learn trust-based relational intervention and we learn how to put those principles into place, our triangle becomes much more um, safe and well balanced. We have connecting at its base because that's the most important thing. We need a group, we need a support system. And so with our kiddos, it's going to be the significant adults in their lives. We're gonna be connecting with them. We're gonna be empowering them through making sure that they're eating and drinking every two hours, that they are receiving um, some type of physical activity, that if they have high sensory needs, we're giving that to them and giving them an opportunity to, to experience what's missing in their life. And then we're spending very little time correcting. Um, and, and that becomes a shock to many when they see once you know they've flipped that triangle, how little time is needed to correct. Okay, this is another great little animate about attachment styles to kind of go overview before I start discussing it. Young children use their attachment figure as a secure base for exploring and coming to understand the world. When they feel safe, they will venture out and explore the physical world and explore the social world. 
that sense of felt safety is a crucial aspect to feel good about moving out into the world. So building attachment is a matter of building connection. And that programming makes us resilient, sensitive to other people's needs, sensitive to our own needs, and a healthy, well-functioning human being. In secure individuals, we see that rich set of connections. When we talk about the attachment, we're talking about the dance between a parent and a child. How well we're able to dance together will determine how well they're able to dance with other people later in life. We also know that my ability to dance with my child is determined by my past to a large extent. But we know that infants who become securely attached have parents sensitive to their needs. But here's the key thing. If they're separated, secure babies look distressed, but the avoidant babies did not look distressed. So they learn to mask this internal state of fear and anxiety, and that's the origins of the avoidant adults' experience. A person may do fine in situations that don't demand interpersonal connection, but when they demand that interpersonal connection, they begin to flounder. An ambivalent baby looks like a secure baby. They can be hard to distinguish. Both babies are distressed when the attachment figure leaves. The difference is what happens once they actually reunite. An anxious, ambivalent baby, they want to be reunited, but once they're picked up, they may push away a little bit, or they may be stiff, or they may kick their feet. We know from research that parents of anxious, ambivalent infants have only been available inconsistently. Now, there's a fourth classification, and that's called disorganized. A disorganized baby has no clear pattern to the way they respond. The person who should be providing them security is a source of pain and hurt, and that shows up in their behavior. When attachment is derailed, we have kids who look angry, can't regulate their emotions, in TBRI, we talk about principles. Well, the connecting principles are designed to promote the kind of relationship that leads to secure attachment. And the engagement principles especially make a difference for children who come from hard places. So it's structure and nurture. But the good news is there's the hope that comes from knowing that this can be done. And the path is awareness. The path is mindfulness. Young children use their attachment figure as a secure base. Okay, so that was Dr. Cross um, that you heard describing the, the attachment cycle. And this is, is basically what, what he's talking about and explaining it. Um, so the attachment cycle is the foundation for trust, self-worth, self-efficacy or voice, self-regulation and mental health. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how important this is in the cycle that we're perpetuating in our communities, okay? So when a baby is, yes? I have a comment for you in the chat. Yes, ma'am. Cassie I'm Leonard. I'm not seeing it. That's okay, Cassie Leonard with MCCA, CCASA. She says she's so glad to Hi, Cassie. see the Pearl Project here. And she's a big supporter. Well done, Beth. Thank you, Cassie. Oh, we, we love them. I, I, yes, we need to get together again. Um, okay, so the attachment cycle, here we are. The baby's born and that baby cries. You're holding the, the little baby. And we know that the most distance that that baby can see is about 12 inches. So that's from breast or elbow to the mother's eye. So you have that baby seeing that. That's, that's that holding the baby and making eye contact and seeing mom's face, okay? Well, if baby is distressed and baby is crying, we know that what happens is that the more that the baby cries, the um, more worked up it's gonna get, the louder baby's gonna get. And What's going to happen is that triggers the sympathetic nervous system that happens, you know, in part of the brain and part of the intestinal tract. And these um, anxiety hormones like cortisol 
are going to be released, okay? And as the baby continues to cry, more and more will be released and the baby gets madder and madder. So mom comes along or the attachment figure, whoever the, the caring, trusting adult is, comes along, picks up that baby and offers it that 12 inches of support, you know, rocks the baby, pats the baby, you know, provides nourishment, changes the baby's diaper. So there is comfort. And that means that after the need was expressed, the need was met. That triggers the parasympathetic nervous system and it releases inhibitory neurotransmitters. Those are the calming neurotransmitters. Um, whereas when the baby's distressed, that distress just goes on. It's like a, a vicious cycle. It just goes round and round and round and round and round and it never stops. And the baby's system continues to release adrenaline and cortisol and more and more and more until the baby can't calm down. You continue that pattern of the baby crying and being distressed and no adult coming to care for the baby and to calm the baby. And what happens? What happens is what we see in, in foreign orphanages so many times. The baby quits crying. And that is what's truly sad is when you have a child who needs to be cared for, but does not know how to express those needs to an adult because the adult is not trustworthy to meet the needs. Um, when we teach the full 24 hour course, Dr. Purvis ha has a video and she just draws the circle on and on and on. And then she takes an eraser and she wipes off the left-handed side of the circle. And to me, that is the most, um, well, my screen is not moving to the next um, little slide, but that is the most impactful moment because what she takes away is the left-hand side, all of the comfort. When you take away the comfort that that adult is giving to this baby, then you're setting that baby up for failure in some way, shape, or form for the rest of their life. Because what happens, there we go. Okay, so the needs were not met and the baby has chronic distress. And then this is what you begin to see with these kiddos. Between ages two to three years old, you see behavioral dysregulation. These are big, big fits, not just two or three year old fits, but fits that last an hour, banging heads against the floors and the walls, pulling hair out by the root. These are huge meltdowns, okay? Then these children go to school. It's not age four to six is not a significant age of brain growth. But what happens at four to six is we take a child and we put them in a foreign environment in a school system. And now you have a teacher who has expectations of this child and the child's not able to deliver. And so they begin to be recommended to be tested for ADD or ADHD. So those, those cycles of, of anxiety, those cortisol being um, release those excitatory neurotransmitters, all of those being released nonstop up until about age eight causes those systems to burn out. So between ages eight and 10, we start to see depression and anxiety because those systems that create the cortisol and um, the excitatory chemicals, like I said, they, they crash. And these kiddos just kind of move along okay we're happy because they're sitting still they're watching tv they're on the couch they're locked in their room but they're starting to suffer significant clinical depression and then by age 12 we begin to see bipolar disorder and behavioral or emotional disintegration um, we know that the attachment cycle is very much set in the first year of life so this is what happens in the first year. If a parent is unable to meet the needs of a child due to their own um, drug use or working several jobs or you know, not having um, safe housing, the parent is not able to meet the needs of the child because they're not able to meet their own needs. And that is going to inhibit the attachment cycle. It's going to, to really 
have become a problem for the parent providing the needs for the child. So the first step to helping the children with trauma um, to help them heal is to give them a voice. And that is the foundation for mental health. When I said we need to form those relationships and help the people express their needs and have good words for that, it's the same thing. We have to give our, our friends, our family members who are suffering with addiction, we have to give them voice and we have to be willing to listen to them and to hear them with a sympathetic heart to develop these relationships, okay? We know that when need is, is uh, not consistently met, those stress chemicals, they're in overdrive. So those, those big behaviors are gonna be over little things. We know that cortisol levels in children with a history of relational trauma, it's more than twice of children with normal development. So you think about that and twice, twice, that's huge. We need to start seeing everything through the lens of attachment. And this is why this attachment cycle is so very important and interesting. Um, we need to let our children learn that safe adults can meet their needs. And that when we meet needs, they learn to trust, they have a voice and that they matter. Um, so at some point, they stop crying to get their needs met, but they use their behaviors. So we still have to look at their behavior through the lens of attachment and meeting needs, right? Oh, I'm going to pause that. I'm going to talk about just a little bit more about attachment. When... Um, Dr. Cross said, you know, that there are basically four attachment styles. The disorganized, avoidant, and ambivalent are totally normal attachment styles. Um, wait, secure, avoidant, ambivalent are normal attachment styles. Disorganized is not. Um, in the normal population of adults, we see, um, I believe it's, it's over 70% of um, people with organized attachment. But in the population that we serve, it's more like that amount for disorganized attachment. Disorganized attachment normally leads to mental health um, diagnoses later in life. So this is something that we need to be very aware of as we move forward. Um, and we also know that as far as attachment goes, 81% of us have the exact same attachment style as our mother. And 76% of us have the exact same attachment style as our grandmother. Now, what that proves to me is that, you know, I, I'm raising my cousins. They are my distant cousins. Their great grandmother and my grandmother were sisters. Their branch of the family, 24 adults, out of 24 adults, 22 have significant addiction disorders, okay? Substance abuse disorders, um, I'm gonna say it that. So we know that that attachment cycle is broken. It's repetitive through the generations. We have to fix what's going on in the homes and in the families so that we can continue to come out in front of the, the use issues that we have and the substance abuse issues that we have. So many of these people are trying to heal themselves and they cannot do it with the substances that they're putting into their bodies, but it helps them forget for just a little bit. So, this next video is one of our um, practitioners up in the panhandle, and she's going to talk about nurture groups. This is something that we do with um, kiddos when we're working with them through TBRI. And I also want to just take a second and talk about where all TBRI is used, because I haven't done that yet. TBRI now is being used in school systems. There are school systems in Oklahoma and Texas that rely on TBRI. Um, there are juvenile justice systems in Texas and Oklahoma, as well as the state of Florida. Um, we had someone reach out to us and put us in touch with DJJ. And um, we, I know that we've had two 
um, people from behavioral specialists from DJJ become TBRI practitioners and they are in the, the uh, middle of training multiple facilities and hopefully we will, the entire state of Florida will become um, TBRI trained and informed in juvenile justice facilities. Um, Dr. Cross has actually been in talks with, with some of the, you know, there are police departments um, that at, available to them. How do they get this help? How do they get this assistance? How do they get some support to get the needs met for a family member? And um, so beginning to have social workers ride along on emergency calls. And that's something that I know that Dr. Cross is, is in huge support of. Um, we need to do more than just training our police officers in you know, just some mental health um, education. In so many instances, we do need a follow up with a social worker and with support systems in place for those families. Um, it would cut down on, on that cost that goes out to, to everyone, to all of our citizens. Okay, so the uh, nurture groups, this is something that's practiced in schools and residential treatment facilities, in family homes. Um, we love nurture groups for Hands of Mercy Everywhere, which is a maternity home here in um, Marion County. Uh, it's a great way. She's going to show you this with little kids, but you do it the same way with adults, with teens, with whoever. So I'm going to go over that after you see the example here from Leslie. I'm Leslie Fuller. I work with the Pearl Project, and I'm here to tell you about a really great tool for connecting with kids and helping them learn through play. It's called a nurture group. Nurture groups can be used in homes or professional settings. Every nurture group begins by reciting the three rules. No hurts, stick together, and have fun. Kids will love helping you come up with hand motions for each one of the rules. Be sure to discuss what each rule means. No hurts means we don't use our bodies or our words to hurt other people. Stick together means we stick together during group time and we listen to each other. Have fun reminds us to relax and enjoy this time together. Learning happens best through play. After you recite your three rules, you'll ask a check-in question. The check-in question can be serious or silly. It gives everyone a chance to share and practice sticking together by listening to others. Once you ask your check-in question, you'll pass around a magic item. The person with the magic item is the only one who speaks. Take turns passing around the magic item until everyone has a turn to participate. If your child doesn't want to answer, they can ask to pass, and that's okay. Take a look at some of these examples of check-in questions. Kids love Band-Aid. At this point in the nurture group, we practice giving and receiving care by asking questions and exchanging band-aids. Ask the child, do you have a hurt? Is it an inside hurt or an outside hurt? Let them know that an inside hurt might be when someone hurts your feelings and an outside hurt is a boo-boo. Tell them, I'm sorry you are hurt and ask them if you can put a band-aid on it. The child can show you where to put it and just like with check-in questions, the child can pass. Everyone gets a turn, including you. The child will love putting a Band-Aid on you. During the first nurture group, you'll make an engine plate that you will use every time you meet together. Engine plates are a great way to help kids recognize how they are feeling. They can move the arrow according to how they feel. Here is one that we made. It's important to let kids know that none of these colors are bad, but we can give them tools to help them get back to green. If they are on blue, you can help them get back to green by drinking some water, eating a snack, or even a piece of sour candy. You can even do an activity that gets them dysregulated and then they can practice their calming techniques. One of our favorites is the mirror dance. If they are on red, here are some different calming techniques. You might choose one or two to introduce each group. The 
core activity is a way that kids can learn a new skill while having fun. As we said before, kids learn so much through play. During this activity, we are learning about personal space using hula hoops. We can use the hula hoops to practice personal space with people or things. Always ask permission before entering someone's personal space. You can practice doing it the wrong way and the right way. Kids can also practice using their voice to say yes or no. Check out some of these other core activities you can use to connect and learn new skills. We love using puppets to help act out the right way and the wrong way to do things. Kids love this. Practicing these skills with puppets when your child is having fun will help them remember them when they were having a tough time. An easy and fun way to teach these skills is through life value terms. Life value terms are short phrases that you can use to help your child remember optimal behavior. Here are some examples. One of our favorite parts of Nurture Group is feeding. Kids love a sweet treat at the end. We like to use gummy bears. Like with band-aids, you can take turns giving and receiving care by asking your child if they would like a gummy bear and then feeding it to them. You can use a small straw and a gummy lifesaver if you don't want to use your fingers. This is a great place to practice eye contact and using good words. The last part of the Nurture Group is the closing. We love to do a hand hug. Stand in a circle, hold hands, and have one person start by gently squeezing the hand of the person next to them. Send the squeeze around the circle, and at the end, celebrate your time together. Remember that a nurture group doesn't have to be perfect. The most important part is that you connect and have fun. Hi. Okay, that may be. Ah, there we go. Okay, I wanted to go back and just say something about the um, attachment styles again. So in the in the normal population, only three percent. Um, around 3% has disorganized attachment. So in the population that we serve as foster um, adoptive families, that disorganized attachment style is closer to 85%. So we know that in disorganized attachment, the caregiver can be frightening um, to the infant or to the child or the caregiver is frightened. So even if we ourselves are frightened, it can project a scary situation to the kids that, that we're caring for. Um, disorganized attachment means that the child does not have any specific strategy for coping with stress or coping with what's going on, what's wrong in, in the situation. And that does often lead to clinical behaviors in, um, in childhood and adolescence. So I, I, I believe you know that this is significant work for us to do. Um, as we continue to work with kiddos in need. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you so much, Beth. I invite all of our participants to enter questions or comments into the chat, uh, or you can raise your hand and we'll recognize you to be unmuted if you'd like to ask a question verbally. Really appreciate all that information, Beth. I mean, you gave us some practical activities you talked about relationships, uh, both for substance exposed babies of all ages and sizes, as well as the adults who may be using substances and building relationships and how that could impact those children. So Absolutely. there's a lot of information in there. We really appreciate it. Where are Pearl Projects located other than Ocala? We actually, you know, when... Um... When I heard this information the first time, I heard ACEs, the ACEs study, and then I heard about attachment. And I said, you know, we've, we've got to share this with every person who has a relationship with another person. Um, our goal was to have five practitioners in five years. It's been about three years and we have 18 practitioners. 
Um, we've got, we have practitioners um, located in Okaloosa and Walton counties. We have Winter Haven. Um, there is Hope Street in Jacksonville, which is a TBRI organization. They're on a little break right now. Um, their founder lost her life. Well, she passed away um, a couple weeks ago, but you can definitely follow them, follow us on social media. Um, we always have tips and hints, um, say, you know, both you can look at, um, I want to say YouTube. Um, if you look for TBRI videos on YouTube, there are hundreds of videos and information um, on TBRI there. You can search um, Karen Purvis, K-A-R-Y-N Purvis, P-U-R-V-I-S. Um, she passed away a few years ago, but there's still just a wealth of resources um, with Dr. Karen Purvis. So um, you can, if you are interested in receiving help from the Pearl Project, you can go to our website, which is thepearlproject.org. You can um, call us, you can send us an email, you can send us a message on Facebook or um, any way. We just don't respond to smoke signals. I think anything else, <laughs> but um, we, will, we will try and help you. And if we do not have a TBRI practitioner in your area, we can try to look for um, alternatives. And, you know, there are other practitioners with other organizations. I know that uh, Family Initiative is in Miami. They are doing just out of this world work um, with kids on the spectrum. Um, we you know, TBRI, there's no end to how it can be used. So it, it gets us excited talking about it. Sharing well, thank that you so hope. much. And congratulations on your growth. That's really terrific. Oh, thank and, you. And my sympathies for your representative in Jacksonville. Yes, so, yes. Yes, but big thank loss. you. Um, again, I'll ask if anyone wants to raise their hand or add any comments or questions into the chat. If not, we'll be able to close out our session. And um, would you state your uh, URL again, the Pearl Project? Oh, yes, it's the pearlproject.org.org. Thank you so much. So thank you everyone for attending today. We really appreciate Beth sharing all of her expertise with us. And um, we wanna make sure that you do go to the chat box to find the link for the CEU survey and also for the evaluation of the session survey. And if you are requesting the CEUs, then you really must complete that survey. Um, we have a session, a full day tomorrow. And if you'd like to join us, tomorrow will be completely different than the first two days in that it will be all open interactive discussions um, where everyone will be able to contribute to the conversation. There will not be a formal presenter, but we'll have a subject matter expert for each of the topics. So those discussions will be ongoing tomorrow. We want to thank FSU for managing our evaluation component of our summit, and we look forward to you checking out your program in the morning. Join us at 10 o'clock for updates and announcements, and then the first session will begin at 10.15. Thank you again, Beth, and I'll close this meeting now.